Futurecast. Hi, and welcome to Deep Leadership. I'm your host, John Rennie. Well, I hope all is well with you today. It is Wednesday morning, and I'm drinking a hot cup of Bottom Gun Coffee from my friends at BottomGunCoffee.com. This is another midweek episode release, and the reason I'm doing this is I have so many interviews that I've done that I decided to release two episodes a week for the foreseeable future, so enjoy this special episode. I have another great show lined up for you, but before we get started, I just wanted to mention my latest leadership book. It's called You Have the Watch, and it's available on sale on my website and on Amazon. In fact, it's already a number one new release and a bestseller on Amazon. I'm really excited about this new book because it's not actually a book. It's a guided journal for leaders. This journal will take you through an entire year of leadership training. There are 50 themes in the book, and each day you will reflect on a different facet of that theme. Now, this journal is designed to be on your desk at work for you to read and reflect on for about 15 minutes each morning. Leadership skills are just like any other skills. You need to practice them to get better at them, and this journal helps you practice those skills. So if you're interested in this guided journal, go to youhavethewatch.com or Amazon and pick up your copy today. Now, if you're looking for other ways to support what I do on this show, purchase any one of my books at johnsrunny.com. Podcast listeners can use the discount code DEEP at checkout to get additional savings. Well, that is it. Today, my guest is Paul Glover. Paul is an executive performance coach, speaker, and author. He is a former federal court trial lawyer who believes in the power of stories to create change and engage teams. Now, what can leaders learn from courtroom tactics? Well, more than you can expect. This was a fascinating conversation that I know you'll love. So, are you ready to dive in? Let's get started. Welcome to Deep Leadership. Leadership is a people business. That's the philosophy of your podcast host, John Rennie. As a former Cold War submarine officer who spent 20 plus years leading businesses in corporate America before starting his own manufacturing business, he knows that leadership matters. Leadership matters. Are you ready for some real world actionable advice from John as well as his expert guests? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. The show starts right now. Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Paul Glover. Paul is an executive performance coach, speaker, and author. He spent 20 years as a federal court trial lawyer before making the transition to helping leaders. He is a passionate storyteller who believes in the power of narrative to influence and educate. I am excited to have him on the show to talk about leadership in this post-pandemic time of uncertainty. So, Paul, welcome to the show. John, thank you so very much for the opportunity to speak to you and to your audience. It's a real privilege. Yeah, I'm excited to hear your story and to talk a lot, lot, lot about your philosophy on leadership because I think we share a lot of the, a lot of common views. But I think you're coming at this from a different perspective, and I really want to get that perspective. Uh, so I'm excited to have you here. And uh, you know, just get us started here. First of all, tell us your story. You know, I, I mentioned in the intro that you were 20 years as a federal court trial lawyer, and uh, now you're a recovering lawyer, and you're in the world of leadership coaching and speaking. So tell us about that and that transition and why you do what you do today. Well, I, I first, I enjoyed immensely my career as a trial lawyer. Uh, I was an adrenaline junkie. And uh, I tell people that trial work, first, if I had to do anything like wills or trust, I would have cut my throat with a rusty spoon. So I spent half of my time in law school and I worked nights, went to law school during the day. Half my time I spent in the courtroom watching because I knew I wanted to be a trial attorney. And uh, and so I did. I, I had a very a thriving civil. I was not criminal, but civil practice. But it was all trial work. Uh, and again, uh, the, the, the concept of trial work to me was always the closest thing to hand to hand combat you can. Mm. Yes. Without being physical, you had a judge who was the referee. And if you had a worthy opponent, it was truly about combat. Uh, There was a jury. Uh, The job of each attorney is to represent their client. We basically become an avatar. Uh, I I never wanted to put my client on the stand because even though they would tell a good story, they also had to be cross-examined. And uh, and the real feature of my uh, my practice was cross-examination. I'm very aggressive and very into it and loved what I did. 
but I also, because I was an adrenaline junkie and because of the type of uh, law that I practiced, labor and employment law, I really associated with a lot of bad guys. And mm. everyone, if you don't know, let me give you a life lesson. You will become those you associate with. Mm. Yeah, I was a bad guy wannabe. And over a period of years, I committed uh, crimes that eventually got me indicted by a federal uh, jury and a federal grand jury. And I was sentenced to uh, seven years in, pr in prison. Uh, and they took away uh, my right to uh, practice law, rightfully so, by the way. Uh, I shouldn't have been allowed to practice law after I got out. But when I did get out, uh, I took a uh, took stock of my experience because I'm a 50 year old guy. I'm now a, an ex felon and I've got to decide what to do for the rest of my life. And as I thought about my skill sets, first, as a successful trial attorney, you're required to be a critical thinker. But but that will not make you successful. The success part of being a attorney, a trial attorney, is to be able to take the jury on a journey with you. Yeah. And you have to be a persuasive storyteller. And I was really good at that. Uh, and, and rather, and believe it or not, I, uh, I, I embraced the concept of the hero journey. Mm. And I would, I would place my client, who might have been a terrible person, in that context. And I also discovered that juries love recovering scoundrels. Mm. And so I immersed the, the jury in a journey with my client and me as the guide. And the hero's journey became how I would tell the story that I wanted them to not only hear, but believe. And as I tell everyone, uh, every good hero's journey requires a villain. Mm -hmm. There has to be an enemy because otherwise Little Red Riding Hood without the wolf is just a walk in the woods. So what we're looking for here is that. And so that's how what I did. Now, that's a skill set and it's a valuable one. So I was a critical thinker. Uh, I, uh, I had pretty good EQ, emotional intelligence required for practicing law in front of a jury. You better be able to connect on a very personal level. Yeah. Otherwise, you don't get to take them on the journey. They have to actually trust you. Uh, and uh, and. I took that skill set and I also looked at what had happened to me uh, as a successful trial lawyer who encountered opportunities to do the wrong thing and did. And I accept the responsibility. I was absolutely guilty of what I was found uh, charged and found guilty of. Uh, but I also looked at it and I said, adversity is a part of life. And if you don't accept the bad parts, the yin and the yang, you're only going to live 50% of your purpose. And I believe that you find your purpose within that, that collection of positive and negative experiences that you have. We're all the sum total of our experience. And I recognize that I had overcome adversity. First, I became very much self-aware of what a bad actor I was. And I took the steps necessary to not only be self-aware, but to change. But I also survived the experience. And I refuse to uh, refuse to say, I don't have a life in front of me. I don't have a profession in front of me. And one of my favorite sayings is, knock down seven times, get up eight. Right. I thought, now this is a lesson that lay leaders who shy away from admitting failure, mm. thought they're infallible, and that that's the way they have to lead, uh, needed to hear. And so I put this, this, what I think is a rather unique uh, set of skills together. And I just started going out and hunting for clients. And at some point I found someone who said, well, you sound like you're an idiot, but, but I'm willing to give it a shot. <laughs> and from that, I now have a national uh, coaching practice. And uh, so that, that long, long explanation for the transition. And I build myself as a legacy coach. Mm. I believe that any leader that wants to be in my program does not have to, if, if you're only interested in becoming a better speaker or better time management, you really need to go find someone else. Because I'm looking for someone who's, who's looking at the long term and who wants to leave a legacy that's worthwhile. Therefore, mm. with purpose and making sure that you, when you do go, you have left behind something of value for the people following. 
And I also tell people that, that everybody I coach is a part of my legacy. Mm. So I am committed to success once that person becomes committed to the process. And, and people don't realize how hard it is to go through a, a transformation. Change is difficult. There has to be a huge commitment. And 80% of the people who are directed to me through a referrals, I don't do business with because they can't convince me they've committed. Mm. Uh, and I tell people I commit. And one of the ways I commit is uh, 50% of my compensation is based on results. So at the end of the year, the person who's in the coaching process with me on their own makes a decision. Did we achieve the goal? And if we did, I collect the rest of the compensation. If we didn't, I don't. So I have skin in the game. So I put both mm-hmm. the and the and the and also finances into it because I found that it hones me to a sharp edge. If you're yeah. Oh, the program, I've got, I've got some real issues with that. So I'm going to do my part, and I expect the person to do theirs. That's interesting. You know, there's a lot to, lot to unpack there, but one of the things that you said, which I think is really unique, and I think people need to understand this, is you talk about your, you know, these uh, skills that you had or these experiences you had, and um, Scott Scott Adams, he's the, the the Dilbert cartoon, you know, draw, and he he wrote a book and he talked about talent stacks. And each of us have a, a very unique set of experiences and skills that makes us very unique. Now, your stack is very unique, right? So, you know, trial lawyer, right? So you have this ability to tell a story, convince a jury, you know, uh, take people on a hero's journey, being the guide of that, right? Then you have your, your experience in um, in prison, right, where you go through tremendous adversity, and then you rebuild yourself from nothing, right? To to so you build a whole bit. So you're you've got so many elements that are key in leadership, right? It's it's being able to uh, motivate, uh, sorry, sorry, motivate but influence people, right? That's a big part of it. That's the same thing in, in trial attorney, right? You have to overcome adversity. Believe me, it's uh, as an entrepreneur, there's plenty of adversity <laughs> in doing what we do. And then the the, um, the whole thing about um, being able to build something from the ground up, right? And you've done that and you've rebuilt your your life around coaching and, and telling your experiences. And I think that's that's powerful. And all those things, again, everyone listening to this, this podcast, you have a unique talent stack that it makes you who you are. Like, for example, me as a former submarine officer, right? That makes me kind of unique in the world of, of leaders. So, yeah, I think that's really good. And it sounds like you use your 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 background to uh, really influence how you teach and how you uh, coach leaders. Absolutely. Otherwise, I'm not sure. that I'm not certified to be anything since I'm an ex-lawyer, a recovery lawyer. Right. Uh, and I, I and I appreciate coaches who are certified. Uh, I get it, but that's not how I do this. And and I recognize it's a different approach. Most coaches do not like how I coach because if you're going down for the third time, I will switch from coach to advisor. Mm. I don't believe people should be allowed to drown. And there are some things the other person does not know for a variety of reasons. And at some point, life is not a mystery if I have the answer. Mm. I'm not going to leave it out there for you to discover it on your own. This is not psychiatry. It's coaching. And at some point, you coach to help the person get better. But if they don't know how to do that, if they, and, and look, I do, a, uh, I do a, a talk about having blind spots. Whenever I recognize that one of the people in my coaching process have a, has a blind spot, it's my obligation to not only identify that, but make sure they know it, know why, know what triggers it. So to not do that, and leaders, uh, leaders have so many blind spots. I love the communication process. Most leaders communicate by telepathy. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, uh, let me tell you that your group doesn't have any idea what you say most of the time. Right, right. <laughs> How about if we work on clear expectations? And they're like, well, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and it's that approach identifying those blind spots and helping them to overcome them, whether it be from a skill set, but also to understand what triggers bad behavior. Uh, right, right. Leaders are extremely sensitive, sensitive to, to being, to someone taking exception to what they have to say. Still trying to get over that because they believe they're infallible and how dare someone challenge them. Uh, so we work hard on that. 
it's not just regular coaching. It also can be consulting and advising, whatever the circumstances dictate. Yeah, it sounds like it. you. You, I was looking through your material, and you say you, you you're the no BS performance coach. What What do you mean by that? And it sounds like well, I know what you mean by yeah, that. I think, it's, I think it's probably become apparent, right? Uh, first, I don't have time for bullshit. Mm -hmm. uh, and second, as a trial attorney, you de you develop a finely honed sense of identifying bullshit. First, the client never tells you the truth right. because I believe that the truth is connected to you either liking or not liking them. And when, when in reality, that doesn't matter, but you immediately uh, start to listen for the bullshit. And in the coaching process, the first time somebody tries to bullshit me, I call. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I may look stupid, but I'm not. So understand, no bullshit in our relationship. Now, what, what you want to do outside sight, I'm okay with that. But we're not going to get along if you continue to think you can bullshit me. So the no BS is the warning. Yeah, yeah. Anyone, if you are actually thinking about this, understand the ground rules. Yeah, I like that. I, it's funny because I, I use a similar thing to my employees. I tell them that um, don't spin any information to me. If I need to spin it as we go up the chain of command, I'll do the spinning. But don't spin it before it gets to me. Otherwise, it could get really out of control. Well, <laughs> so. well, first, it's such a waste of time and energy to right. this falsehood or this false narrative. And I can't understand. Well, I understand why people have all sorts of reasons for not wanting to tell you the truth. Yeah, yeah. They want to make themselves look better most of the time. And the reality is, I look, I tell people, I look bad. I'm a, I did bad things. I went to prison. I have no pretense about me. Why would I? I can't mm. be embarrassed, which is, as my wife says, is really a fault, by the way. She, she wants me to be embarrassed about certain things. And I say, in the professional world, everybody knows my story. And I cannot be embarrassed. But what that does is it eliminates the need for me to do pretense. Yeah, yeah. I expect the same thing from the person in the coaching process. We either trust each other and are vulnerable and authentic, or we shouldn't be doing this. Yeah, I like that a lot. You, um, and, and this wasn't one of my questions, but I was just thinking about it. You know, I watched a video you you had put on about uh, the, the importance of the fool uh, in, in, the, in the medieval ages where, you know, there was someone that that could advise the king and not lose their head, basically. And, and I find with leaders that... Uh, so oftentimes there isn't that role, somebody that can actually tell the truth to the leader. Everyone is running around scared. Everybody knows the leader is kind of clueless and he doesn't really know what's going on and he's making bad decisions, but everyone's too afraid to bring it up to him because he doesn't have like a trusted advisor that has the permission to speak the truth. And mm -hmm. you, you talk about that in one of your speeches about the importance of a, of the fool during those, those times. And, and, uh, and I think as your, as an advisor, it sounds like you're playing that role a bit with that leader. Absolutely. And, and, and what you say is absolutely true is that people don't have the cycle. We talk, by the way, I love the fact that we've all know the jargon, psychological safety, mm. right? We're going to create the circle of truth, the all of the right things to say, except for the fact that the leaders are are just aren't there with it. They know what they should do, but they're not ready to do it. Why? We hate criticism. Yes. We told them we're wrong. And if I'm the leader and you're not, now I have a positional authority over you and you're, you are even less likely to say something to offend me. That's why I believe that leaders that want to get better have to go outside the organization, yeah. a coach or an advisor, because I operate from a different position, right? I don't, if you want to, if we're not getting along and you don't like what I'm doing, I'm okay with ending the relationship, but you're not going to scare me about it. And my job is to tell you the truth, to be your fool. That means that we have to trust each other enough to have this exchange of accurate information. And then, yeah, if you're doing something that I believe is uh, inappropriate, I'm going to tell you about it. Mm -hmm. What I find interesting is that's the value of a 360 degree. Because I don't know you and I don't know what you do, but your team knows you and they know what you do. So I need to access that information so that I can start to understand your good and your bad points. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's interesting when that comes back again with the, uh, the the easiest one for me is always the team who then gives me the information about how bad a, com a communicator you are. 
And for me to tell you that, since we're having a very limited conversation, you would go, well, you don't, how do you know? You don't know. Uh, <laughs> team, but, but you know what? The team has got to have the anonymity to tell an outsider who they trust more than you the truth. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Leadership skills are like any other skills. You need to practice them to get better at them. Best-selling leadership author John S. Rennie knows this. That's why he's written a new book called You Have the Watch. It's a guided journal for leaders designed to take you through an entire year of leadership training. By the end of the year, you will master 50 of the most important leadership skills. If you want to have a greater impact on the results and people in your organization, go to youhavethewatch.com and pick up your copy today. I think it is hard for leaders to get outside their own heads sometimes, right? And just to, you know, I can tell you, I know early on when I first had my first manufacturing plant at 32 years old, I actually thought I had to have all the answers. I thought I had to be the expert at everything. And so I was, you know, like, uh, you know, even if even if I didn't know the answer, I would, you know, make something up because I thought that's what I had to do. That that's what the leaders do, do, right? You have all the answers. Everyone comes to the corner office to get wisdom, right? And then they, you know, they they come down from from on high with directives, right? And they go implement those directives. And it was that in that plant, that first plant, um, where I learned that I didn't need to have all, you know, the answers, that the answers resided in the minds of my teams. And I had to be humble enough to spend time with my team and talk to them. And like you said, this 360 and listen to them like, all right, you know, I'm new here. I'm young. I'm very young, 32 years old. I don't really know the best way of doing things. You know, what have you guys tried in the past on this issue? What is work? What? So in, in other words, just, um, You've got to get get out of your own head. You got to get your let go of your ego, and and spend time listening to your people because they have the answers. If if leaders were willing to listen to their people about their own leadership style, you would they wouldn't need people like you or I, right? That is after we'd be putting ourselves out of work, and I hope we do. I can yeah. tell you the most important thing for a leader to say is I don't know the answer. Yes. Yes. And the guts that it takes, unfortunately, the guts that it takes for a leader to say that is immense because it, they think it's going to shatter their image. And once the image is shattered, first, I'm curious as to what you think your image is, because that's probably not how you're actually perceived. But once you do that, you've lost control. And you see, it's control, isn't it? I need to control everything. And that, to me, is all about lack of self-esteem. Yeah, it is. It, it yeah, is unreasonable, think, unreasonable expectations. Yeah, there's fear. I see fear a lot in leaders where they fear of being uh, discovered that they're really not as smart as they think they are, or they or, or they've put themselves out to be, or they're not as great a leader. So there's a fear that they're going to get discovered that they're not really as good as they say they are. You know? Well, that's that imposter syndrome. I think I'm an imposter. We're all imposters. <laughs> yeah, exactly. One of, not one of us is an expert at living our own life. Uh, I've got a quote I use with my presentations, and uh, it says, I've never had trouble, more trouble with another human being than I have with myself. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> and, I, and I ask everybody, I go, well, now, now that you know my favorite quote, how many of you think it applies to you? And the entire room raises their hand. Right. So we all know this, but we don't know what to do about it. That's where the fool comes in. Yeah, yeah. That's really, I love that. I love that analogy. That's really powerful. Um, I wanted to just, uh, you mentioned this, and I really love this. Um, trial attorney, you're used to telling a story. You're used to taking people on a journey, being that guide. Um, you you mentioned, this is really important, that you say that uh, storytelling in the workplace is, is an incredibly effective way to influence and educate and to communicate. Um, why is storytelling so powerful? And what can leaders learn from, uh, you know, embracing storytelling in their, in their management, you know, philosophy, if you will? Well, first, I, 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 again, I tell people very basic things. We have storytelling baked into our DNA. Yeah. We all, that, that was the deal, right? Written word 3,000 years ago. Before that, someone was verbally telling us a story around the, the fireplace in the savannah in Africa. Yep. 
and it was powerful and it, it, it related information we needed to know. But it also did something else. It connected us on a human level. And I look at the relationship between leaders and their teams have always been thought to be, well, not thought to be, have always been transactional. Mm -hmm. And a tra transactional relationship is only as good as the next raise. You don't get discretionary effort out of a transaction. What you do get that type of necessary discretionary effort is out of building a relationship. And storytelling is does exactly that. It is me and you having a, a very Im, Im, just important connection where I'm telling you not to do something, but I'm telling you why you should do it. The story is about the why. The story is about the purpose. When I talk about my clients and I tell leaders, you need to take your people on a hero's journey because it is a hero's journey. Yes. And like you, you've had that experience and you said you started it and here 32 years old and you suddenly realize what you don't know. Yeah. Shocking, right? It's a shocking revelation how much we never know. And I tell people, I tell leaders, if you think that you're going to know it all one day, that's not how it works. And it's Involved, you realize how little you know. The storytelling is to uh, let people see the authentic, vulnerable person that is the leader. And by telling them the story, I like the I like the organizational creation story. It's a great story. Everybody who started a business has that story. Or yeah. I came into the organization and it was in shambles. And by the way, I now have that story of rehabilitation, rebuilding. Think about all the stories. And if we relate that to people, telling them real things that they can relate to. And if you do that, they follow you. See, that's leadership. Leadership is about I'm going to tell you a story with a purpose and meaning. And if you want to join me on this journey that we're going to take together, and I'm going to treat you as a partner. I'm going to treat you as an equal. And we're going to walk this path together. And at the end of it, we're going to celebrate the, the, the journey. How do, how do people not get on board with that? No, most people who don't want to go on the journey leave and should. Find another journey. So that's, that is, if that answers your question. That yeah, it's fantastic. And I think part of the journey is, uh, is talk, a very... You know, aptly describing the destination, the vision, where 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 we are, where we were, where we are today, and where we want to be, where we aspire to be, and 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 your role in this journey with me. And um, you know, I I always say that uh, leadership is about people influencing goals, right? So you need people. Obviously, you're not a leader if you don't have people. You, you and and you have you have goals. You have something big you're trying to get done, right? And and then it's about how do you influence people to achieve those goals? How do you, you know, intrinsically motivate them to say, this is what I want to do with my life. I want to be part of this organization and I want to achieve these goals together. But I think you're right. We're taking them on a journey to some destination, some vision of the future that they also buy into this shared vision of what this could be as a workplace or as a, uh, you know, as a, as a, uh, as a as a company, you know, that's doing, you know, something that's never been done before, right? It's being part of that journey, something special. And I think people want to be belong to something that's bigger than themselves. So they want to, they want to know they're on a journey. They want to go home and tell their spouse that, you know, we did this thing today that's never been done before, you know? And I did and it and the money is necessary just because guess what? We all have to live. But, right. but it's never the driving force for this journey. It is a byproduct of the journey. And I, there's a, I, I use an example, and I'm not sure if it's even real. It may just be apocryphal, about the new head of NASA. And he's walking around introducing himself to people. Yes. And the cleaning lady, have you heard this with the cart? She's, I love this. Yeah, so do I. It, it, that's why I use it over and over. Uh, she's pushing her cleaning cart. And he goes up to her and he introduces himself. And he sees that she's got a cleaning cart. And he looks like the cleaning lady. She's in uniform. And he says, so what do you do here? And she says, I help put a man on the moon. That actually chokes me up just saying it. I love that. Someone who is that committed to the journey. Oh, my God. Discretionary effort above. We always talk about these words above and beyond willing to do the hard thing. 
That's what you create with storytelling. That's what you create when you bring people with you. And leaders need to understand the, I, I, my contention is it's, it, we, we complicate our lives unnecessarily. Leadership to me is about three things. It's about being a coach. It's about being an inspirer. And it's about being a commander. Mm. Three things have to be a part of the leadership. And you decide based on the circumstances, the situations, which one. And the journey is, and, and encouraging people to come on the journey are about being the inspiration. Yeah. And I need to show you, I need to show you what has meaning and purpose here of our journey. Otherwise, you won't go with me. I can't say I don't know. And if you say it's about making money, then what the hell? It's uh, yeah. not a journey for me. That's just a job. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting, too, because I've seen it firsthand. You know, I've went, spent 22 years in corporate. Now I've been six years as an entrepreneur. You know, in, in my big corporate jobs, there was so much I could offer employees. I could give them, you know, tuition reimbursement. I could give them travel abroad. I could I could give them you know, promotions and what have you. Now, as a small business owner, uh, I can't, you know, there's no travel. There's no tuition you know, but <laughs> them is that I can give you interesting work and, and I can bring you on a journey and doing something that's never been done before. And, uh, and to do something that's bigger than just yourself is to be part of something changing an industry. That's what we're going to do in this company. We're going to change the way that the, the, the customers are serviced in this industry. It's like people are like, yeah, I want to be a part of that. I want to be part of something that's different and special and unique. And, and they can be, have a significant role in that journey you know and i think i see people fired up i'm like why are these people still working for me i don't have anything to offer them why don't they leave me for a big corporate job and make more money but they they're staying with me because because of the journey and the mission that we're trying to do so absolutely i you're spot on with this and look i also again i'm very simple i believe that engagement is not hard Hmm. It, it is three things Attraction, attention, and appreciation. I actually call it the three A's. The attraction is just what you said. Why would I want to be with you? Why do I want to work with you uh, in your company, side by side, doing the hard thing? There has to be an attraction that makes people want to do that. And that's exactly what it is. It's meaning, it's purpose, it's vision. We know all the words. We have to be able to express it through storytelling so that people understand it and connect to it. The second one is attention. People crave attention. And the reality is we give people attention for a variety of reasons. But if we do, that's our relationship being built. Mm, Yes. Attention to you. And when I do, you will reciprocate. Everybody is into reciprocation. Whether they like it or not, we're hardwired for that. I will do for you first. And I and and I don't even have to say it. It is does not have to be expressed. It's understood. You will reciprocate back. That's how beings relate. That's why we were able to get together as a tribe. And the third one is appreciation. I am shocked at how little we say thank you to people. Yeah. Sitting in a restaurant and I ask someone at the next table to pass me a shaker of salt, I will say thank you. At the end of a 40-hour miserable weekend during the pandemic, you know what the leader, team leader would say? I'll see you on Monday. That's like an invitation back to hell. Right? Yeah. Yeah, a miserable week. And what do you want me to do? Come back? How about I appreciate the fact you stayed with me for this week from hell? I I, I love everything you do. I, I love you as a team member. And by the way, the word love, where leaders are afraid to say that, that's part of the human experience. You can oh, yeah. a variety of ways. Don't be afraid of the emotion. It matters. Uh, and if you do that, and you're authentic and you're vulnerable and you want to know for them to know how much you appreciate them. That's all you have to do for engagement. This is not complicated. Yeah, it's about it's about having a relationship and having, you know, and connecting with, you know, I, I say in my books, leadership is a people business. It's all about people. It's all about relationships. It's all about um, caring. You know, you mentioned uh being polite. And it's just such a simple little thing to do. I had a, I had an employee said to me, uh, she was in her fifties. She said, you're, you, you're the favorite, you're my most favorite boss uh, throughout my entire career. And I said, well, why is that? She said, you say please and thank you. And you smile. I'm like, really? Is that all it takes? I mean, it's really so well, by the way, that many bosses don't do that. Oh my God. No smile. Are you kidding? They might. <laughs> 
a human being. Right. <laughs> well, if you smile, they think something's going on. Right. Sure. It is that easy. We just we've been taught as leaders not to do it because to be professional and professional eliminates the relationship. It is nothing but transactional. And the pandemic, if it's taught us nothing else, it's taught us that that doesn't work anymore. People want personal. They want you to care about them and you better express it. So I think that the pandemic is God knows that I hate it as much as anyone it actually has cracked open that, that hard shell of professionalism and said, you can't, you will not be successful if that's your approach. Yeah. And, and as you would say, it's really, it's, it's really critically important as we come out of the pandemic, we're in this, you know, uh, this period where a lot of people are looking for new jobs, 40% of people looking to, to change their career and 50% of those people are doing it because of their boss. They're looking to change what they're doing because of their boss. So if there's ever a time for leaders to be engaged, to, to get to know their people, to take down that veil of whatever that is, that fake uh, leader, you know, role they play, that professional, you know, you know, facade they put on, this is the time to do it. Your people want you to be real. They want you to be authentic. They want you to have a relationship with them. Yeah. That's it's it's never been more important than right yeah, now. Absolutely. And and you're you're spot on about that. And I still believe people leave their bosses more than they leave for money. And if they like the boss, the statistics show you got to give them at least a 20 percent increase before they'll even think about leaving. If they hate their boss, zero. Yeah. Just get me out of here. No. Yeah. Too easy. And by the way, as, as I tell people, it, when it's too easy, people think it's hard. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. So um, this has been fantastic. I mean, we're just running out of time here. How can people find out more about you and what you do? What's the best way to connect with you? Uh, it's paulglovercoaching.com. Uh, anybody who uh, emails me at paul at paulglovercoaching.com will get a response. Or you can find me on LinkedIn at Paul Glover Coaching. Okay, that's fantastic. We're going to put uh, links in the show notes for those resources. And just listeners, this is powerful stuff. Uh, storytelling, we talked about the importance of that. We talked about the hero's journey. We talked about relating to your people. Uh, all these things uh, are really critically important to be able to connect with your people, especially right now where a lot of people are reevaluating their careers, thinking about going to do something different. Don't be that boss that people are running away from. So, uh, Paul, thank you for being on the show and sharing all of this, uh, all of your unique experiences. And I think it's been really helpful for all of us. Well, John, thank you so much. As I said at the beginning of the program, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's a real privilege to talk to you and your audience. And thank you for the engagement. Yeah, thank you again. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Reddy saying take care and lead well. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all you do. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information and updates, please visit our website at www.deepleadershippodcast.com or johnsrenny.com. Until next time, take care. Miles, are you ready to record our promo for Season 2 of the Wanna Bet Podcast? David, have you ever seen a grown man naked? Miles, we're not here to quote lines from Airplane. We're here to tell people that Season 2 starts August 18th. But I like Airplane. I know you do, but Wanna Bet is a sports betting podcast. Each week we bet $1,000 on the NFL teams and games that we love. Well, that sounds like fun. It is fun. And last year you picked over 60% of your games correctly. How'd you do? We're not talking about that. We are telling people that they can find us every Friday. So no more movie quotes. Roger, Roger. Electric acid. Are you passionate about saving the planet for future generations? Do you want to learn how to do it? If yes, then you need to tune in to the Nature Back podcast. It's a talk show covering the changing world around us. From renewable energy, sustainable agriculture, circular economy, to ESG and social innovation. Don't miss this opportunity to discover how you can join the movement and make a difference. Subscribe to the Nature Pack podcast today on your favorite platform and get ready to be amazed.